17th chapter. Glory to the Lord. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There's also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly. We are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, so, uh, full disclosure, I'm, I'm not really good with authority figures. I'm not sure about you guys. You tell me what I'm supposed to do or what I have to do. <laughs> well, it's probably not going to go super well. Um, I mean, a sign that says don't touch wet paint. I won't touch that because it's wet paint. I don't want wet paint on my fingers, but don't walk on the grass. Don't do this. Don't do this. Or you have to do this. It, there's just something deeply embedded in me that wants me to resist that and because, well, you can't tell me what to do. It's just... You're not the boss of me. Yeah, that's right. You're not <laughs> the boss of me. Um, I take a bit of comfort in the knowing that that I'm not alone in feeling that way. Um, and going back and reading the creation story, it's clear that humankind, given a free will, resisted authority from the very beginning. There's a long tradition of people who have said, you're not the boss of me. Even when clearly the one who created you out of the dust of the earth and who was God and gave you everything you needed and said, I'm giving you anything that you want or need, everything. Just stay away from that one tree. And Adam and Eve are like, nah, I'm not so sure. You're not the boss of me. And that's essentially what they said to God, was you're not the boss of me. And God's like, really? Boy, they, I am the boss of you. I made you. Ever since then, human beings have struggled with authority figures and striving greatly for our own independence. You have been around children or raised children of your own or grandchildren. You're probably aware that one of the first things, one of the first words that they learn is no. Nobody teaches them no. But as soon as they're able to verbalize a thought, that's more often than not the one that comes out. It is very much a part of who we are that we are going to resist authority and fight for our own independence because, frankly, we think we know better than just about everybody or everything else. And over the history of mankind, as it's recorded in Scripture, that's been proven uh, over and over again and almost always, well, no, I'm sure pretty much always, with fairly disastrous results. Um, as we have continued to study the books of Samuel, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings, when a, uh, the people requested a king, demanded a king from God, after having gone through the desert 40 years with Moses and conquered Canaan, 
of the leadership of Joshua all along the way, God providing for them in the desert with water and manna, fighting their battles, taking care of them, comforting them, being ever patient with them, always saying, I am your God, I am your Lord. And once they're settled in Canaan, after God had done everything for them, the people gather together and say, we want a king so we can be just like all the rest of these nations. Well, all right. Okay, I understand that. But you realize that if you ask for a king, here's what's going to happen. The humans that you have that I pick, I select to be rulers over you, are going to do things that you don't want them to do. They're going to steal your land, they're going to take your children, they're going to tax you, they're going to be, well, people. If that's what you really want, you can have it, but I strongly suggest to you that you don't do that. I have been your king, I have been your lord since the dawn of creation, and I'm batting a thousand. I have never failed you people. And yet here you are asking me for a human leader. And after God warned them all of that, what did they do? They shouted, we want a king! Just like all the other nations. Another one of those moments where God said, ah, all right, have it your way. Throughout the stories that we've read in 1st and 2nd Samuel and continue to read in 1st and 2nd Kings, what do the leaders of the people of God do over and over again? All of the things that God warned them that they would do. The, the phrase usually starts, or the introduction to a new, new king usually starts, so-and-so became king in the year of this other king. They reigned for so many years, and they did evil in the sight of the Lord, leading the people of Israel away from God. Over and over and over and over and over again. Really, really not the smartest people, because after all they witnessed of what happened to their predecessors, the new kings did the same thing. We can't help it. It's just part of our DNA, and it's our nature to be rebellious and to want to do what we want to do, and to say to everybody who wants to be our boss, you're not the boss of me. You can't possibly be smarter than I am. And so we run around in our lives and in our worlds, much like those kings did, thankfully not doing the destruction that, or leading destruction to large groups of people and exiles and things like that. But um, we have a good, well, we have a lot of people before us that have done the same thing. And, and throughout the Old Testament, as it was all happening until the exile again, eventually God just he didn't change his plan. He didn't come up with a new plan. This was always going to be the way that it was. God stepped in and took care of things for us and gave us a new king, the one that Jeremiah had prophesied about, a good shepherd, one that would protect and watch over and do the things that the good shepherd, the good king would do to rule and reign selflessly and sacrificially because that's what a good king should do. To give hope to the people of Jeremiah's day that maybe there would be one king that wouldn't lead us to be exiled to Babylon. And of course that, that king would be Jesus. And Colossians, the writer of Colossians, does an amazing job, uh, as much as our human words can do to describe the nature and the character of who Jesus is and was and will always be perfect in every way. The one who God gave to us to be our Lord, to be not just our Savior, to offer to us salvation, but to lead and guide us in our lives. Because God knows exactly what life is like on this side of heaven 
because of what sin has done to creation. And when God leads, when God gives command, when God steps in and says, I'm kind of the boss, we have a hard time trusting that because the human authority figures in this world have and will always fail us because they always have and they always will. It's just our nature. We trust in people to lead us, whether they're bosses, whether they're teachers, whether they're parents, it doesn't matter. And none of them are perfect in what they do because when we get some level of authority, there's always going to be a little bit of abuse of that power. Always. Whether it's realized or not, there's going to be some level of distrust that comes along with that because frankly, we have an agenda. It's people who lead, we do. We wanna get what we wanna get. There is going to always be a selfish component in the human leaders. We just finished a midterm election, my goodness. Oh. Every one of them would seem like spent most of their time, energy, and money telling us how bad the other person's going to be and how selfish they're going to be in leading us. And then their opponent did the same thing, and it's like, wow, choose between the two evils. Which one is the lesser of the evils? And then we complain about how bad they are because they only do the things that they want to do for themselves, and it's very self-serving, and none of them serve us the way that they're supposed to serve us. And that's just one example, and it's relevant because of what we've just gone through. But looking at Jesus as our king, looking at him as our Lord, what is the motivation of God? What motivates God to want to be our boss, our king, our Lord? Is there anything God, anything Jesus can gain by stepping into that role for us? Is there anything that he needs that we can actually provide the creator of heaven and earth. Rationally, but clearly the answer to that is no. God will never, ever, ever lead us, or guide us, or direct us for selfish motives. It's the nature of who God is, being perfect. There's nothing that God needs from us. From the beginning of time, when God created through Moses and giving of the law and the commandments, Christ as he instructs us, commands us, guides us in how to live our lives, it's always been done from a place of love and grace. For our sake, God leads and guides us for our benefit, not just to be bossy. And it's just so hard to listen to that, to believe in that, and trust in that, because the message we get from every other aspect of our life is, well, I don't feel like doing that. That doesn't work for me right now. I can think of a better way to do this. And we resist and we resist and we resist. The passage chosen for this Sunday from the Gospels at first might have struck you as odd. We're speaking about Christ the King Sunday. And it's the story of Good Friday. It's the story of his humiliation, of his crucifixion, and of Jesus' death on a cross. Certainly not the way a king should be treated. And it's a bit of a head scratcher until you realize, until you think about what the message is is in his death and crucifixion. Am I doing it all for you? I gave everything that I had to give. Gave up my authority as God to come and live among you. To live like you. To suffer humiliation, pain, and torture, and ultimately an excruciating death to prove to you that I did it all for you. 
but I have nothing to gain by losing everything. That you should know my being Lord over you and your life is to your benefit. That the best life, the best possible life we can have here on this side of heaven is to allow God to be our king. To worship him alone, to let go of false idols, to trust in him completely, even when it seems like things aren't going the way that we want them to go. Because that's life. It's not always going to go the way that we want them want it to go. And when that's happening in our world, there's nothing we can cling to other than the one who's the boss of it all. He's never going to fail us. But it's hard. It's our sacrament of baptism is something that can perhaps help us in this. It is our drowning, our dying to ourselves, being reborn again, refreshed and renewed and cleansed from the corruption of sin that is very much a part of us. The symbolism of that is a very, very powerful thing. It's a very powerful thing for us that can remind us that, man, whenever the, <laughs> the fit's hitting the shan, <laughs> that there is one who's in control. There is one who is our king and who is our Lord and who will never fail us. It's the one who hung on a cross for us to prove to us without a shadow of doubt that he is the one. He is the Lord of my life, the Lord of your life, the Lord of all creation. Something we can all celebrate and certainly rejoice in now and every day.